My name is uh, Marije Meerman. I'm uh, a director and editor-in-chief of the Backlight series uh, that we make for uh, v uh, broadcasting company VPRO. After the fall of Lehman Brothers in uh, 2008, um, I was not someone who read the uh, economic section uh, in the papers, um, but after the fall of Lehman Brothers, I was really, uh, like so many other people, amazed by, uh, by the impact that the, this financial sector could have on the whole um, economy. And so uh, I decided just to dig into the subject and, and, and decided that this should be the topic that I would like to make films about. Um, I then found an op-ed written by George Dyson. Um, he's an author and son of Freeman Dyson, the famous um, uh, physicist uh, who works at Princeton. And um, George Dyson wrote this op-ed um, in which he spoke about the quants. And I had never heard before of quants. Um, and he explained that quants are the people who are writing the algorithms on which the financial industry, um, the financial sector functions. Um, and these are people, normally everybody's al always talking about the bankers, but the quants are the people that um, you know, write the infrastructure on which uh, uh, the whole sector uh, functions. Um, and he was... Um, uh, sort of uh, not blaming them, but sort of exposing them uh, to the world. So uh, I found it so fascinating that uh, I decided that I would love to um, show who these people are, um, just because I knew so little about them, and um, because the uh, the fact, the the the, um, the cause of the financial. Uh, 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 crash, uh, where these uh, mortgage products uh, in, uh, that were um, issued uh, mainly uh, by American banks, um, and that these uh, these pr uh, mortgage products were based on an algorithm, um, and I wrote an ar uh, I read an article about the person who wrote this algorithm, this quant, um, and. That's why I decided that I would like to portray these people. In the end, it was impossible to find this person because he f it was a, someone with, from Chinese descent and he uh, fled to China. Um, with the idea that these people are sort of, you could say them, sort of the Oppenheimers of the financial system in the sense that um, um, they're working there, they're writing, they're helping the markets function, but um, not necessarily, not necessarily know what the impact is of uh, um, the work they're doing, and that led to not only uh, making the episode uh, "Quants, the Alchemists of uh, Wall Street," but also a uh, reconstruction of the flash crash, um, which is about automation of the uh, financial markets um, um, that really came to light. The, amount, the, the level of automation because uh, of the flash crash, uh, the American uh, markets uh, dropped 10% in a couple of minutes. So, um, and then after that I made the episode The Wall Street Code um, on Heim Bodek, uh, which is a story about a quant uh, who felt betrayed uh, by, uh, by, the ex by the exchange that he was uh, trying to uh, work on. So it was a trilogy in the end that I made on the automation of the financial markets. Well, I was very naive uh, starting uh, working on that uh, portrait of quants in the sense, and uh, it showed especially in the fact that I thought that people working for companies would like to talk to, uh, to me, would want to be interviewed, but uh, it soon turned out that nobody wanted to be interviewed, that people working within the financial sector um, sort of hardly ever talk, or maybe they give a short interview to uh, uh, Bloomberg or the Financial Times, but only within their own uh, uh, um, uh, arena or uh, bubble. Um, 
so I sort of started, yeah. So who I was just sort of it was uh, making sort of a circle around quants working within the sector. So who would be people who uh, knew quants or are quants? but are not within the corporate structure. So um, I came to talk to the person that's writing the handbook for quants. I spoke to a student, a quant student. I spoke to um, uh, uh, a guy that's um, working for, has his own company, his own boss, and he's um, um, uh, sort of cleaning market data to make it available for um, everyday um, uh, traders. Um, I, I spoke to, um, oh, it's a long time ago, um, I spoke to the person who wrote the original software on which the uh, mortgage-backed securities were based, who wrote it, uh, I think, already end of the 90s, um, and who was already um, left Wall Street and uh, started uh, being an, an oyster. Uh, fisherman uh, in front of his house. He had a, a very luxurious house um, uh, upstate New York and uh, not so much to do, enough money uh, to be bored. And then uh, suddenly realized that the water in front of his, uh, his, his villa was also his and that originally a lot of oysters were being, um, um, had grown there. So he became an oyster fisher. So he was delivering oysters for chic Wall Street uh, uh, restaurants uh, now and harvesting them. Um, so in a way, I spoke to the people, um, yeah, the observers, the people that were had been inside, who wanted to get in the sector. So the so these were the people who wanted to talk to me the and and the entourage. That's the right word. So I spoke to the entourage. Um, of the of quant world, in that sense, um, and I was maybe most shocked by the fact that I spoke to a quant student, and uh, we had a very nice conversations. We filmed filmed in his class uh, at university, and then uh, when we wanted to do the interview, uh, he suddenly called me and said, um, "I'm sorry, I can't uh, do the interview because I'm too afraid that if I talk to you, I will." won't be able to find work when I finish my studies. And um, it was really very, yeah, uh, and I couldn't talk him into it again. So then we decided, uh, I was just sort of freaking out like, <laughs> you know, how can, I, how can I find a solution? Because I found his perspective uh, on the narrative very interesting. Like, because he's, he wanted to enter the sector, he wanted to become a quant. So I asked him to write a sort of a short diary uh, on his motivation, on his background, on his motivation, um, what he liked so much uh, uh, in this uh, world, of this quant world. And, um, and then he was willing to um, uh, read that out loud for me. And so in that sense, then the whole episode became, in a way, the diary of an aspiring quant. Um, but that was just by accident. That was something that, la that happened on the last day of shooting in New York before we had to uh, catch our last flight. This is money, okay? And Espen's talking about making money, making money, making money. Every year you're making money, and then one year you blow up. Now, the difference between this being your money and it being a hedge fund is if this is your money, fantastic, you're making money, you're down here, you're bankrupt. If it is somebody else's money, if it's a hedge fund that does this, every year they're taking a percentage, they're taking some of that as profit, as their bonus, effectively. So they make some of that, they make some more, they make some more. All of this money they're putting into their own bank account. And then, when they lose money, that's their client's money that's lost, it's not their money. The Backlight series is being broadcasted on Dutch television, uh, 28 episodes on a yearly basis. And um, the best of our, our, our episodes are being translated now and subtitled in English, German, French and Spanish for a worldwide audience. And uh, we're very proud that the European community gives us the opportunity 
to uh, to provide this to this uh, in these four major languages. And um, it's always in the back of our minds, every topic that, w that we're working on, uh, how much could this be interested, in what way could this be, th this be interested, interesting for an international community. And, um, um, and, and along the way also uh, have sort of, in a way, sort of a Dutch angle on, on uh, global affairs in all different aspects uh, uh, that we're presenting. And, and sometimes also Dutch architects or uh, people from Dutch finance or um, scientists or uh, whatever uh, we try to uh, yeah, mix in our, our stories. Mm. Well, because um, uh, Backlight is now already in existence for 16 years. This is our 16th season. And um, we realized that um, uh, after the fall of Lehman Brothers on the 15th of September in 2008, for 10 years now we have been reporting on the global impact of the financial crisis. Uh, and we decided that we are future, future affairs, but we decided that sometimes it's important to uh, also look back to see where you come from to know where you will be going to. Um, so we went uh, through our archive, I think at least 25 episodes that one way or the other had to do with the impact of the financial crisis these last decade. And uh, we sort of um, tried to <laughs> get this into a very condensed story of uh, 45 minutes and we uh, went back to three people. Um, Isabella Kaminska, she's a journalist uh, for the uh, financial um, newspaper, Financial Times. Um, she was in an earlier episode on Bitcoin, also very popular uh, on the channel, uh, where we interviewed uh, or portrayed uh, Roger Ver, the uh, also called Bitcoin Jesus in Japan. Uh, we went uh, back to uh, Anne Pettifor, an uh, economist uh, from London, um, who we interviewed already twice, once just after the financial crisis happened, where she uh, predicted the the. the rise of uh, populists um, after the, the, the financial crisis would uh, sort of deepen, especially with the euro crisis uh, coming. And uh, Nomi Prince, she's a former banker who worked for Goldman Sachs, also for Lehman Brothers, for Bear Stearns, and she's an author now. And we interviewed her earlier on um, an episode that's also on the channel, Goldman Sachs and the Destruction of Greece, um, in which she um, tells a story of how Goldman Sachs helped uh, the Greek government to cook the books uh, how, and, and thereby entering the European Union. So we went back to these three women and um, asked them uh, how, what they thought of the last 10 years and where they think we're going to. So the title of the episode is uh, Calm Before the Crash. Um, because these three ladies not only predicted the crisis of 2008, in that sense they are three Cassandras, but also they're very worried about uh, where we're heading now and they all three uh, foresee that we're maybe not far from the next crisis. Um, so that, uh, yeah, uh, brings everything together. I'm not in a position to uh, do any predictions, not at all, but um, of what we've been reading and talking to people in, during the research for this episode, I personally I'm worried um, and um, uh, yeah, it, but I can't make any predictions. I have not so much to prepare for with. I mean, uh, Isabella Kaminska was uh, uh, storing bags of rice. Um, well, there's one thing that sort of, uh, I always think I've not enough cash at home. I think really, you know, there's only the cash machine's not working. What kind of, you know, things that I, would I have in my house that I could sort of barter or exchange for other things? I've been filming in uh, Argentina after the crisis of 2002, um, where money had, didn't have any value anymore, and the only thing people had, uh, they were this whole uh, 
barter economy that started and I don't have many things to barter so that's things uh, something that I really worry about like you know maybe I should have some small gold pieces in the house or uh, I don't know anyhow things that are worth something I mean uh, now it's not more, more than my laptop that I have in my house that is worth anything. So. Did we waste a crisis? I think that's a very good question. Did we waste the cri crisis? I think that in some ways we introduced a lot of very effective legislation. We've imposed a lot of smart thinking into the system. The problem is all that regulation has just created an incentive to ignore uh, everything we've learned and start again, making the same old mistakes we were making before. Well, having things that are worth some, something at times of, in times of crisis. Um, uh, Nomi Prince, uh, uh, in the episode, uh, tells us that she um, sold her stocks and bonds, that she sold her pension products and that she um, sold her house and bought a smaller house um, so that all the sort of, uh, uh, yeah, bubble value that's within these assets that, um, that she will be able to, uh, to overcome uh, a next crisis uh, best way possible. But, and then there, of course, is this whole movement of, of the ultra-rich that go to New Zealand and uh, buy land, uh, citizenships, uh, transfer uh, uh, capital uh, toward New Zealand. But I'm afraid I'm not within that category. I'm, I don't have any Bitcoin, uh, so I'm just... Uh, 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 I, I'm a complete outsider, but I, what I find interesting about the phenomenon of, uh, phenomenon of Bitcoin is that it created a new 1%, a 1% that is uh, so different from what used to be for so many times, the, 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 the 1%. Um, so people are really uh, uh, have a very different worldview, very uh, much against government, uh, nerds. Uh, very much into technology, um, a lot younger than most uh, most of the one percent um, that were there before. So, uh, so I, in that sense, I find it a fascinating uh, uh, group of people mm -hmm. that I think uh, is uh, interesting to f follow up on, maybe for our next episode. Mm -hmm. No, we're not. I can be sure. <laughs> I mean, but what's, I mean, that doesn't mean that we won't be preparing, but we're, uh, there hasn't been a director yet who has uh, proposed a story that, uh, to, uh, on blockchain. Also, it's a very interesting, but also very difficult topic to visualize. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, with all topics uh, on the financial uh, uh, sector also, but also Bitcoin and blockchain, it's really difficult how to visualize, uh, how to make a visual story on these kind of uh, topics. So, um, uh, yeah, so I know it's difficult, but I would be, I personally would be interested to see it. I would love to, yes. Um, and uh, going through all the, uh, all the older episodes, I think uh, a follow-up on the automation of the financial sector um, is really something that I would love to work on. I'm, I don't know yet how and when, and, um, but I think uh, somewhere in the future. Uh, if, if, if I have to choose one of the documentaries that I made for uh, the, the Backlight series, I think um, Money and Speed Inside the Black Box, which is a reconstruction of the flash crash that happened on the American financial markets in 2010. And what um, I personally find fascinating about this story is that it's still not clear till this day what really happened. Um, so the Americans accused um, a day trader that live, was living with his parents close to Heathrow Airport um, that he was sort of the mastermind behind the flash crash. 
and they even uh, got the English so far that they extradited him uh, to the United States. Um, but within the community, nobody takes it seriously that he was the one that uh, or was sort of the, the, the mastermind of, the, of, of this uh, enormous um, drop on the financial market. Um, so I think there's still no conclusion. So um, maybe that could ask for a, uh, a follow-up. Um, but I, yeah, I would be curious to come back to this story and see uh, where it is now and um, yeah, what we need one day to find out what really happened and what were the causes of this flash crash. And you recommend this one? Yeah, 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 because I, maybe people have, uh, could help. Yeah, who done it? Yes. Right. Solve the story. On May the 6th, 2010, at 1400 hours, 42 minutes, 44 seconds and 75 milliseconds, an e-mini future traded on the Chicago market begins to show erratic price swings. The fluctuations affecting this e-mini, an important indicator of market moods, soon spread to other shares within the US, ultimately leading to the fastest and most dramatic fall of Dow Jones ever. Nearly $862 billion go up in smoke, albeit briefly. Thank you for watching. For more on this subject, take a look at the playlist. You can also watch this recommended video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and we'll keep you updated on our documentaries.